Uh, Yelena, you give me a yes. start whenever it's, it's suitable. Okay, all right. So then, uh, since uh, the most important person is here, <laughs> Pierre, I think we can begin. Professor Tsenkova, you ready? Professor Tsenkova, yes, yes, yes. you're ready. Yes. All right. So, technical support ready? All right. Well, good morning, uh, Europe. Good evening, Japan. It is very nice to see you again here. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to our previous webinar. We collected your opinions. Um, it was very nice to hear that you liked the webinar and to hear your suggestions for future topics. So today we are starting with the second webinar and um, uh, this webinar will, um, just like the previous one, uh, be available, recording of uh, the webinar will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. So you can hear the previous web webinar already uh, on YouTube channel and after today, uh, starting from tomorrow, uh, there will also be a video recording of this webinar uh, with a very soon Japanese transcript available. Today, unfortunately, we do not have um, real-time Japanese transcript, but uh, as from tomorrow, you can come back to this lecture and hear it again with Japanese uh, transcript available. Um, just one um, warning <laughs> for everyone. Uh, please stay today um, uh, until the end of the webinar. We will have a, a poll organized to again hear your opinions. And um, it is very important for us to know what you think. And of course, one more thing. Um, last time we um, gave one book as a present. Um, the book is already sent to uh, Professor Omar uh, Pyrus from Malaysia. And today we will be giving uh, our um, book as a present to another person who will be randomly chosen. So please stay and you might uh, win the book. So I think this is all uh, the basic information that I have. Um, we can now start with our lecturer. Today's lecturer is Dr. Pierre Madel from Austria. Um, he has a very, very um, wide background uh, starting from electronics, but basically he's an engineer and uh, he has expertise across one, I think, very wide field of disciplines and um, a lot of actually um, experiences from all around the world. But I think many of you already know him and I know that many of you expressed a uh, sincere uh, wish uh, to, to join this um, lecture. So now I will be giving um, um, a word to, to Pierre. Pierre, you have one hour. Afterwards, we will have um, questions and answers, discussion time. So we can begin. Thank you, Yelena. The very, thank you, this very nice introduction. And thank you to, also to Lawrence who helped out for the technical issues that we just solved. And hopefully it will work out now fine. Um, thank you also to Yelena and Romiana for having given us the chance to give this contribution in this framework because it's not a common thing to do this, because this topic is a little bit sensitive, as you will later on hear. Um, thank you to Rom Romianas again for, for having given me the encouragement a couple of years ago to dive into the subject, because when she came over to Europe, we talked about it, and we suddenly realized, oh, there are so many potentials in, for aquaphotomics with these two guys, then we need to do something about it. Um, that's a contribution for aquaphotomics of this early spring. However, the time frame was a little bit too narrow, so we couldn't pack anything into it. Not too much, at least. And thank you also for the numerous participants who are interested in sharing or in hearing these particular excursions. There's one limitation, though. I cannot present you Herbert Lettner. He, there is it's Professor Lettner is over here, because uh, due to recent events at the university, I mean. There have been a problem with uh, strict governing and the strict handling of corona measures and critical re reports back and forth resulted in, in a very harsh reaction from the Dean's office. So he's trying to settle out what can be done at this moment. So that's why he cannot join us directly. And, okay, why is that moving? 
Okay, yeah. However, today I'm focusing only on this guy, on Victor Schauberger. Wilhelm Reich is interesting, but we don't have the time. It's far too much. It's a little bit exceeding this lecture, and I've spared this, as, as I said already last time, that we're going to do a separate lecture on this particular topic and his achievements, because he too has a lot that you find in quantum electrodynamics that needs to be highlighted and, pu and put again under a new, let's say, judgment. And then I leave the judgments to you if it fits or not. So for so far today, we talk about him, we talk about what we talk about the vortex formation, we will talk about how he interprets it, that he calls it the blood of earth, which means he differentiates between dead water and living water, and what this means and what's the, what are the implications for living structures. So one common thing though for both of them is the pulsation argument. So both of them have found out that pulsation, the oscillation pattern is crucial. Yeah. And both of them rejected the common notion of the dose effect relationship that is so well known in pharmacokinetics. Instead, they envisioned a hormesis like approach, which is a much better fit. And that's we're going to elaborate in the next couple of minutes. So I start off with um, a very simple demonstration. I mean, part of it is not yet done. George Schrecker is working on a laboratory setup to reproduce that. So what I can show you at the moment, I mean, he's already quite far in his laboratory investigation. However, we don't want to, let's say, pop up with preliminary results, but we would like to see when the results are solid enough. So I'm gonna share you a little, little video. If I can find it, okay, there is it. And let's stop the presentation. So let's see if this really works properly because last time we had a problem with the choppy presentation. So can you see the, the screen with the, with the video? Yelena, can you help me out? Yes, yeah. I see. Okay. okay, so it's not yet moving, so let's go to a minute three. So what this guy is actually doing, so slowly. Sound okay. Okay. So he fills in a bottle of carbon dioxide in a half full bottle of uh, water. And in this bottle of water, there is a nebulizer, an atomizer installed. So he fills this uh, bottle so much, so, uh, so he fills this bottle so much with CO2 in order to make sure that hardly any residual air with nitrogen and oxygen is left. But since CO2 is heavier than, than air, so you can actually see this, this demonstration will, will still give you a positive result. And while it's now activating the nebulizer, it forms an aerosol mist interacting with the carbon dioxide that's in the, let's say, supernatant volume space. So you see this foggy aerosol and it's probably a little bit larger than 100 nanometers because you can see it. So, and it starts to, actually what you first realize is that the balloon put on top of it starts to shrink. So this little shrinking becomes more manifest the longer the system is running. Which means in this case, the aerosol, the, the aerosol fraction in the gaseous phase is, absorbs much of the CO2 because of the smaller size dynamics. If the particles are so small, because we don't have to underestimate that that what we see is 100 nanometers or 400 nanometers, depending on the size range, but there's much more, uh, there's a much higher, smaller fraction that we don't see, that we cannot perceive with the eyes. And actually what is happening now that the shrinking process is taking place. This particular setup is not very well done. What needs to be done is a proper temperature control, a pressure control and all that, what you see here, which is missing, will be done in George's lab and that is still working and elaborating. So, this shows you only that there's something happening that's quite interesting to follow. So I stop it at that moment. So, because he speaks in German, so it's probably not so interesting. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. Uh, we are here. Good. 
Oh, yeah. So another thing that both of the pulsation aspects, yeah, so both people, so both in this case, I mean, Schaubel and Reif have addressed in the pulsation framework is something that is a cyclical repetitive pattern. And Schauberger termed the cycloid spiral space curve. It's a kind of a maximum oscillating pattern then decrease in an amplitude and then reverses its direction. So it's a, a kind of an, a jumpy, jerky, back and forth swinging process. You can envision it like this here. This is the sun circulating or with the circulating planets around it. As it travels with, uh, with the, within our galaxy, the solar system, it's a very simplified sketch. But in this case, you can at least imagine what this cycloid spiral space curve should all be. And it's cyclical, it's pulsating, and it's a unique primordial creative curve that embodies the unbroken path of evolution. So you find it in evolution, in biological system, but also in abiotic systems of cyclical pulsating out of foldment and infoldment as it spirals in and out. So this is something that Schauberger obviously documented quite early in his career. So let's face this from a different angle. Let's look at it from the fractality point of view. And here, I need to first shed some light on the fractal principle. So fractal structures are highly dynamic. But at the same time, with a surprising permanence of geometric regularity over great distances. So this is something very intrinsic and very crucial. It's a pattern of conservation. It's kind of a law of conservation. And it regulates many of the evolutive processes. And which is most important is it reaches out over many scales of magnitude. So we will see this, the scale-free property which means it hasn't any dimension. It's a dimensionless unit, it's crucial. So in this case, I, maybe I should give you a recommendation to have a look at this book from Heitgen, which is a very nice introduction to fractality. Yeah. What I've also shown here is the Koch curve, which is a very simple fractal structure. You have a straight line divided equally and then form, let's say, self-repetitive patterns. And you can use it in a circular arrangement, a linear arrangement, and this is the same over here. So what is now interesting, and I would like to give you a brief introduction into what Bernard Mandelbrot back then postulated. And we, go, we don't look at the full video, it's just about a minute or so that we dedicate time to. So let me stop there. Okay, let me go back to the... And that's the video section. I open up. So then I need to share my screen again. Sorry. Where is my team meeting? There is it. No. So where is it? I don't see it. Why don't I see the video? Uh -huh. Okay, let's go to screen number one. Mm. See the video? Yelena, can you see it? Can you confirm it? Eh? Yes, we can see. We see. Perfect. Okay, good. So he started out with a very simple, uh, let's say, algorithm, just a power function. And yet he repeated it, a self-similarity -similar pattern, and found out that if you, let's say, feed it back to the original equation, you can come up with, with let's say, autopoietic self-similar structures, which in turn are nothing else than a replicate of the original structure, although at a different scale level. The scale is different. So now we are zooming in into it, yet find again over and over the same patterns. That's the self-similarity -similar rule. So. How much time is the video that we programmed it for? Okay, another 20 seconds to go. And they've been interrupted. So it reach reaches out from the microscopic domain, nanoscopic domain, all the way to the galactic domain. So there is no limit whatsoever on it. 
So this is a biological example and with that I stop the video otherwise it will take too much time. You can download these videos in the literature section. By the way, I have in the PowerPoint presentation all the literature and the reference relevant links given. So for you, it should be easy to access these kind of source materials straight away. So let's go back to the presentation. Oops. So now we're back again here. Let's change the slide. So this is now an extension of the fractal property because now we're looking at water. So we have here a fractal pattern, which is the spiraling other uh, pattern over there that you can see, and we will we'll see it in the video quite shortly. However, we have also something that is quite unique. We have a soliton property. And the soliton property in this case is quite crucial for the biological, uh, has quite huge biological relevance. Yeah. And in that case, I should show you the video straight away because this makes it much more comprehensive what it means. So do let me go stop the presentation. Let's go back to the evolution video. Evolution, there it is. Let's open it up. And let's see if we can. It's loading, it's a little bit slow, but it breaks so let's share the screen. Where is the video? Do you can see the video? No, you cannot see the video. Okay. Can you see the video? No. Why can you not see the video? Yes, we, we can. can. We can try to play. Can you see the emergence of small scales in vortex? Yes, 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 it's playing. Okay, I don't see it here, but anyway, it's playing. So there are two colored, watercolored uh, inject. And what you can see here is something quite interesting. It's a pattern that forms of a bifurcation process. So you have a, just what this called. This is a Actually, it's the wrong video, but anyway, we will reverse the, 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 the video sequences now. That you have a bifurcation pattern that is, also the first bifurcation pattern is when it collides. This is symmetry break, as a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Then you have a second one and a third one. And however, I, did, I didn't want to show you this straight off. I want to sh show you the, the, the other one, the evolution, because it's, it's going to break away why I have this long video, but let me see. Okay, let me stop this video. You have seen the essence, which is now, okay. Okay, stop this. And now I'm, I would like to show you the other one. Um, and break down what it is. This is the raw file. I'm not quite sure why it does this. Probably, uh, no, this is the one. So do you see, no, not yet. I need to share my screen. So, okay, screen, screen number two. So you should see the video now. At least I hope so. And this, the system is just a piston, a nozzle, and a water tank. Um, so this here, is the, here yeah? we don't see anything. You don't see anything? Yes, oh, yeah. please. This is not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see the video now? Uh, not yet. Y uh, your screen. We see your no, screen. No, no, no. This is not a good idea. So I need to. Okay, let me see. If I stop that one, I go to the other. Where is it? Do you see the video? Do you see a, a drawing? Sketch? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay. So this is the schematics, uh, and this is the kind of results that we produce. However, what you see here is the fractal structure combined with a soliton property. And this is the original video that I wanted to share. 
material. So now it comes up and now you see as it propagates as a standalone unit through the medium, detached from everything else and it hardly dissipates. And this is the essence that I wanted to show you. So since I spent a little bit of time on technical issues, I'm not gonna elaborate this any further. We probably have time to do this later on. So let's go back to the presentation. Mm. Good. Okay, this is the same as this one, as I, sh I showed it beforehand, with the bifurcation, the second and the third bifurcation properties, which is nothing else as a spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. We will talk about this later on in, in the QD section. However, solitons are not only just that. Soliton properties can also be found in very simple environments like this in a water tank. And I'm gonna show you this little video, which is a nice little documentation of, of how this works because it illustrates you how uh, this non-dissipating structure, oops, sorry, let's stop that. This non-dissipating structure, let's see, it's a shallow water tank video. Okay, let me see. If you see the video, do you see the video or not? Can you see a guy standing horizontally? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they give him a shift, that that and, and this water tank it propagates along the water channel and hardly without any dissipative character. So it's a feature that is quite unique, and in water medium, it's very very easy to replicate. But it can be easily yeah, replicated maybe, uh, also in another context, in, like in, in, in less, in a, let's say, in, not in a laboratory setting. And the laboratory setting is one thing. So, and I'm going to show you this vortex, ring collision, vortex, 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 where is this? Rings in the pool. There it is. Now I need to open this with VLC because this is a different format. Okay. Okay, let's go share. So do you see the, the physics girl section? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So we go to section 19. So she, she puts a plate, as you can see, she dives into the pool with just a standard plate and creates a vortex. And what you see is this is a just a reflection of the incident light from the sun as it mirrors back at the bottom of the pool. If you dye it properly, you can actually see this half ring vortex is actually nicely penetrating through the system. And I know not everyone else so as this is online anyway, I'm not gonna dive into it deep into any further. So you can access this one in by YouTube. So let's go back to this one again. So, and so the, the properties though, is that this particular characteristics is not just limited to the water and uh, just the tricky pool games that we have seen, but also we find it in biological, in, in spiral, let's say helical uh, molecules, macromolecules, and Davidoff, Professor Alexander Davidov nicely elaborated that already a couple of decades ago, where he has shown that these can be found in alpha helixes in any kind of repetitive macromolecular polymer. So this is some kind of reality that we have to deal with and the implications are not yet fully understood. A nice summary of that can be accessed in Petrovkov's uh, book of biosolitons. However, he presents the biosoliton approach in terms of, um, let's say, the, the orto and para water cap uh, proper, uh, pro uh, capabilities, uh, orto and para characteristics, sorry, the spin isomers of orto and para water, which is, of course, another way of interpreting it. However, we are doing it in, as you will see later in the QT sections, with coherence domains, because it's a much more elegant way to do it. Nonetheless, this particular biosolitons have, let's say, an, oops, an ensemble 
that creates, let's say, a collective behavior. And it behaves as is would be a single entity. However, yet it is something of a cluster of multitudes of, let's say, molecules involved, as you have seen in the solid on example, the pool or in the ring and the water tank in the lab. So it is something that behaves as it would be a single unit, a microscopic single unit. So we can describe it in terms of quantum electrodynamics much better than, let's say, you know, in an atomistic point of view, on a mystic perspective. And this we will do it in a couple of minutes when I can when we come to the QT section. Uh, Schauberger, on the other hand, used this particular cycloidic space spiral curve in order to show that when you have a natural flowing river, it spirals forward. It's a vortex that actually is a longitudinal direction in the same flow direction as the, the rivers. And it forms vortices in such a way as it hardly floods the banks. However, if you don't regulate this natural stream or this natural creek, you don't have or very seldomly have floodings as devastating as we seen, have seen in the past. However, if you start now to straight them off and you don't allow the water to move in this like longitudinal vortex-like manner, there's no way anymore that these vortexes become longitudinally manifest, but they become vertically manifest, which means they're no longer in the flow direction, but orthogonally oriented, which means they're drifting out towards the banks. And that we can, we can see in terms of regular floodings, devastating floodings, and so forth. And he was also coming across some, some very peculiar observations during this analysis. He found out that the dense and colder water moves faster than the outlying water layers, which means you have the denser colder waters in the center and the ones at the perimeter at the outside are slightly warmer, which means you have a temperature gradient inside. It's very difficult to measure. I, I always wonder how did you do this? However, he postulated this and documented this in several of his papers. So less dense water outside, denser water inside, and this determines that the flow propagation in a naturally flowing river system. And what needs to be said um, in this particular context? So he talked about, let's say, in this particular let's, natural environment of something that he calls the life or the energy state of the river. So the life energy of the river is such that if it degrades, for example, by badly regulating water systems, the river regulation, for example, the longitudinal vortex turns into vertical vortexes and then becomes a destroying or the energy dissipates into the, over to the banks, to the nearby environment, is no longer concentrated in the natural flow dynamics. Furthermore, he then devised, based on that, a system that he uses, or actually did use because he got an engineering contract with one of the landlords to say, well, we don't want to lock the, the, the timber from the mountains with, and bring them down by horses, but isn't there another way of doing that? And he came up with the same approach and found out logging the timber and putting them or placing them into cold water that form these vortices keeps timber float that has a density that is heavier than water because they induce this vortex, a rotational vortex, which means they produce a, an auto, let's say a rotational dynamics into the lock so that it doesn't sink as readily. And therefore he needs to control the water dynamics, which means he has to remove the warm water on top and feeds in the, the cold water from the bottom. So they continuously refreshes them. And there was a nice uh, original video from the 1920s, I think. Let's see if we find it. Um, lock flows. I uh, need to open that from VLC. That's an old historic uh, documentation, but I think a nice presentation of what Schauberger back then achieved. So I hope you can see it. So. So this is a, a dam filled with logs and hundreds of them. Ecologically, probably not very sound, but that's the way that the past how they did it. Yeah. So in order to transport it down the valley into, let's say, the 
the mills and the wood processing plants, they conceived this channel system that Schauberger designed and built himself with his engineers. And then they tried to sh shift them into a certain hydrodynamic channel. And you can see this, this entire system is quite efficient, and, and especially the precious woods, the heavy woods, could be transported without any harm, without any damage, and became, let's say, a very safe and um, a very efficient way to transport huge amount of woods from the mountaintops to the bottom. As I said, a very problematic ecological perspective, but back then it was a common way to do it. So, then, in this process, so I stopped this video. Okay. Then, in the presentation, so. Okay, where's the mouse gone? Okay, here. Yeah. So, you should see the presentation again. So, then you came up, okay, what happens if you close this and make pipes? So he came up with a wooden pipe, a system that allows you to transport drinking water in wooden pipes. And in order to induce this rotational dynamics into the water pipe, he introduced veins. You can see these little veins in this patent. This is one of the patents he, just, uh, he, he developed and handed in, and they have been also granted. So it generates a kind of internal vortex and like a ball bearing, transport the cooler waters inside and the warmer waters outside, forming these little secondary vortexes. So it forms kind of a, a cushion, a um, ball bearing, so to speak, where the cold, fresh water is transported inside with hardly any friction. And as you can see from this particular sketch, there's no thing as a laminar flow. There's, everything is turbulent. Furthermore, he found out that if you use the system in such a way, it has a purifying effect. So how it comes to the purifying effect? So something peculiar has happened in this particular thing. We come to the purification process when we talk about the, the, the vortex dynamics and do this in, in terms of, of practical applications. One thing though that he introduced is instead of using just wooden stakes here, he used a copper plated uh, silver elements, ah, silver, silver plated copper elements in order to use a bactericidal property of silver. So this is what back then an approach that he said should be beneficial. However, I think it's not even necessary because the way it is designed, you will see later on, it does so without actually use of silver in any case. Um, there was one exemplary uh, investigation at the University, Technical University in Stuttgart, Professor Purple. He came up with several tests that he designed especially for Schauberger in order to make sure how can we test this peculiar behavior that Schauberger observed. They came up with several pipes, straight pipes, spiral pipes, dented pipes, conical pipes made of copper, made of glass and so forth. They tried several things. And you can see the experimental setup is such that it consists of a constant water leveling system and the monitoring system. So just the tank and this is the, the measurement site. So you have adjacent outlets three of them calibrated with vertical glass tubes. The left-hand tube, for example, is this one over here, measures the available head of water and is directly connected to them, which is kind of obvious. No? This is the tube, the connecting tube. The others though, the right-hand and the center tubes measure the pressure gradient at the outlet over here. So you can actually use, the, depending on the flow regime, how much pressure change can be observed. So this was more or less the, the experimental setup that Professor Pepper came up in order to satisfy the request from Victor Schauberger in terms to document the peculiar effect if there is any. A particular aspect in one of these pipes is not a circular form, it's a dented form. You can see this is a circle with a dented spiraling, and this is the spiraling property that you can see over here. And the cross section should always look like this. So we're looking at this particular pipe here. This provides peculiar results. There's an error here, I need to correct it. I already noted this, noticed this yesterday. It's not pipe six, it's pipe two. So we're looking at pipe two. And the other pipes, 
well, they have some kind of peculiar behavior, but it's not very striking. What you have though is pipe number two, so this particular pipe over here, somehow behaves oddly different. There are regimes where you have more less friction, more friction, and sometimes even negative, which then becomes very peculiar. So this kind of very interesting results, I again picked up by George in his lab, and we're trying to figure out how can we do a proper setup with modern technology and not with the standard technology from the 50s, because Pepper published this almost 70 years ago. Yeah. So this is ongoing research and we need, want to see if we can reproduce this effect by one, using one of these copper pipes with a dented cross-sectional area. So now we come to the vortex, classical vortex formation. So the vortex that in this case is necessary is because Schauberger wanted to extract the flow dynamics of a river into let's say a laboratory setting and see, okay, what is the essential of this Cyclo cyclic space, spiraling space curve. And he came up with this kind of hyperbolic funnel. And this was together with his son, Walter Schauberger. And they tried to, to study this in a very scrutinous way. And they, they achieved some kind of interesting results. So one aspect is the form in this case mirrors the amount of energy the system contains. And you can literally see this kind of nodes and internal structures in this particular section that flows through the funnel. This is the aqueous phase, this is the gaseous phase with air. So it's, it's in this case a biphasic, biphasic system. And this is a schematics that, that came up later on by, by, by Callum Coates that he interpreted the data in such a way. However, there is something that needs to be said in the interpretation of Callum Coates because it's not so straightforward. So this pulsating and unique primordial creative curve is again found in this, let's say, particular section and highlighted in such a way as now you can study it in a laboratory setting. And this has been done in a recent work in 21. So this year is published in, at the University of Delft. And they try to see, okay, which is the best flow machine? You need to have the twisted section. So this is the classical twisted section and not in any kind of uh, restriction or straight. So the cone has to properly form this nodal internodal structure. So this is the ideal pattern or in a sketchy form it's this year. If that's given, which means you have a certain flow regime, then something quite peculiar happens. And this, in this case, you can aerosolize, or then let's say to, to gases, in this case, the standard uh, aeration efficiency, the amount of air bubbles introduced into the water body can be controlled. And in such a way as it outnumbers any other of the mechanisms that are available in order to, let's say, bring the gaseous medium into an aqueous phase. So it's one of the best. So this is the hyperbolic funnel with the twisted form. It outnumbers all the others mechanically generated device or the mechanical device that are available in order to introduce a gas into the gaseous phase, uh, into the aqueous phase. So it's very, very efficient. And just look at the numbers, huh? the, the, the classical um, standard aeration, aeration efficiencies that yeah, ranges from minimum to maximum. It, it's, it's unbelievable. So this is something that is quite new and this, Pointing at the novel aspects that Schaubeck already knew 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Another thing is the cleansing effect. So Schaubeck documented in the river system, the cleansing effect. So if you look at the hyperbolic funnel, you have a hyperbolic funnel that's missing here, but here you have it. There's no cleansing whatsoever in just a standard system. But if you induce a vortexing effect, you have that. This is just a petri dish with cut grinded coffee powder in it. And if you look at that, then you can see the coffee powder as you're running through the system in the vortex manner, forms a tiny thread at the center. And this tiny thread is now the way where the debris, the dirt accumulates. Yeah. So as a result of the aeration of the entire body of water within the hyperbolic funnel, there's a net increase in flow speed at the center compared to the periphery. So it accumulates, it's, it's a speed 
is there and accumulates the debris. This implies the greater quantities of water are transported in the centermost region than in the near boundaries. The cleansing effect of water can be visualized in this particular case. So the next thing is, um, why is this happening? Why is this peculiar shape uh, necessary? And they found out if you take a cross section of the hyperbolic funnel, it turns out to be egg shaped. There's the pyramidal looks like an egg with a flattened and a pointed end. It's a classical form of any chicken egg, of any egg whatsoever. And nature uses this concept all over. So it, this is obviously for Schauberger and for the Schauberger family. Walter Schauberger and Victor Schauberger came across something that is intrinsically found in all different forms of life, especially in the, in the juvenile stages, so the stages where life is about to develop. It needs an egg-shaped container. And in that case, if you, but this is just one aspect. If you look at the, uh, I'm not gonna show this video because it's, it's obviously possible to imagine how the water runs through this vortex this copper funnel vortex, we can access it on the net anyway. What we see, however, is a skinning effect, a charging effect. So there is obviously a structuring effect in terms of charges observable that become intrinsically embedded into the molecular orientation of the water dipoles. So we have here something that is very, very interesting in terms of charge and maintenance of charge and interaction with biotic structure. We will come to this also. So we have now a central problem. The one is that in engineering approaches, we use a centrifugal approach. Schauberg instead use, uses a centripetal approach. So if you look at the classical, let's say, propulsion systems, you have cavitation effects, like you can see over here, corrosion of hard metal surfaces or Pelton turbines in energy producing devices, which corrodes the Pelton turbine over here. And if you look at this in, in let's say, and dark field microscope, microscopy and look at the patterns that when you have dissolved minerals in it, and you find that the structure of the water that has been run or passed through a system is quite fractal. It's quite distorted. It's no longer, let's say, a normal homogeneously looking water fraction. If you don't have that, the central petal, so the Schauberger approach like water treatment, looks much more amorphous. It's a continuous flat, and we can see this. I mean, I can show you, if you have time in the discussion, a sample of, of, of water that has been treated in such a way that it becomes almost solid. A water that is solid at room temperature. I have a tiny little uh, bullet. So it just remind me at the end of, during the discussion that I show you this. It's from Professor Vittorio Lia's lab in, in Naples, where he actually shared it with me and, and said, well, this is one thing that is quite interesting. And then, I have another sample that can show you what happens when you amalgamize water with oil, which means as a stable product. And I can show you some samples also, where you can see this 20% uh, oil and 80% water, and it doesn't separate. There's no phase separation, probably because of the very efficient centripetal movement of water. So in terms of uh, larger macroscopic phenomena, we will come to the hurricane and cyclone issue in a quite a second. However, the dynamics is, I think, best illustrated in this particular sketch. We have the centrifugal versus centripetal radial actual motion. So this is the technical approach that we use. It's an extremely energy requiring process. It's noisy and it produces a huge amount of, let's say, a wide range of secondary effects like cavitation, like mechanical stress breakage and so forth. This is all that if you use the reverse direction, that is something that can be avoided with a minimum of energy usage and maintain the maximum output at the same time. So why it hasn't been yet used this, uh, in, 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 in engineering approaches? This is a question that I have to ask the engineering community. Yeah. So why I'm using this here? Now we take a little ex excursion into spontaneous breakage of symmetry. This is necessary in order to understand how cyclones and um, tropical um, thunderstorms, when they, pick, they turn into a cyclic motion like hurricanes, come and come about and form. 
And this requires already a brief excursion into quantum electrodynamics. First of all, I would like to uh, show you the video. Now let's go through the topics over here before we come to the video. So the atmospheric vortex formation is a spontaneous breakdown. And a spontaneous breakdown in this case means we have a very weak perturbation that induces in one way or the other a coherent, it's a spontaneous, uh, and it's, sorry, sorry, it's an appearance of massless boson, massless goldstone, number goldstone bosons. And they are uh, capable of entering, being in bosons in nature. They're capable of entering in coherence. We will talk about coherence later on once we have, once we reach the QD section. So in that case, we come about a long range, or once these form, we come about a long range molecular interaction and they can accumulate to such an extent as to form a macroscopic phenomenon because they become, as a fractal structure, scale up from the microscopic domain to the macroscopic domain. Yeah. And then form a, a classical soliton, a soliton that stretches for thousands of kilometers. So let's have a brief look at the video. That gives you a better interpretation. Where is the SPS? Sorry, oops. There it is. No? Let me share this with you. I hope you see it. You should be able to see the video now. I just play it forward a little bit. So, so this is oops. I need just a brief section here. So this is the potential that we are looking at, and this kind of undulating process. The bottom bells over here are those ones that form when the system enter a new bifurcation point, and these bottom points are energetically more favorable. This requires, however, that coherence does happen. And the initial conditions, for example, looks like this. This is just simple modula modulations. Why? Oh, no, it's moving, okay. I hope you can see the video. Yeah. And once coherence builds up from a microscopic to a macroscopic domain, there's one single state that's prevailing. And this one single state in, for example, atmospheric condition forms the hurricane or the cyclone, the tropical perturbation that you found in the most tropical regions. You can see all the other states are eliminated and on one single state is left, the energetical most favorable state. We will come to this particular issue about what is the, the coherent ground state in a couple of, say, couple of minutes. So let's stop the video. Good, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Good. So we have the initial conditions, conditions which is just a single well, which is stable primary branch, but then with the kind of tiny perturbations that build up coherently, let's say superimposed, become uh, bistable, in this case, a two-dimensional stability, and then the process starts off. As I said, we will talk about this later on. So, this is a snapshot of a tropical cyclone in, on the east coast of Australia. Queensland is over here, and you have just an infrared image and the false color enhanced image. And also here, Schauberger speaks, when you are encountering such a phenomenon, it's a, a process that this, the atmosphere uses in order to self-cleanse. We have seen from the hyperbolic funnel that it is a, there's a self-cleansing process taking place. It accumulates dirt and the debris at the center of the vortex. And so it seems that something similar is happening also here. This is something that he postulated and this has not yet been verified scientifically. So this is still a huge potential to be elaborated when we talk about Schauberger's interpretations. So, before we come to the QD section, a brief excursion about something else. He has deceived another prototype where he can show that artesian wells not just work spontaneously in terms of pressure gradients, 
but cru crucially with temperature. Temperature is a huge, a crucial aspect. So you have a YouTube field quartz sand uh, YouTube pipe, which is exposed to ice, so to keep it at four degrees C, and then to maintain it there. The other patch, the, the capillary segments are exposed to solar, solar radiation. So in this case, you have, uh, let's say, one is looking out and the other one is un kept on the dark. Yeah. As soon as the sand surface reaches the temperature of about 20 degrees C, the density anomaly of four degrees pushes the water into both capillaries. So, which means there is something dynamically happen between temperate radiance, darkness and light. And light is something that we will need to talk about in a couple of seconds. The only, I show you the, the Pozzo Petrusca in Perugia in Italy, which is one of the probably most likely classical examples. It's, it's, Perugia is a little village in, well, that's, it's quite a village in Italy, it's central Italy, but you find the Pozzo Petrusco, Petrusco is historic. Well, that's already there for thousands. Well, I'm, at least I'm not quite sure how old it is, but since the existence of the city, and it has been there already since the time of the Etruscans, which means we can speak well over 2000 years. And Schalberg tried to interpret that between the temperature pressure from below, the deeper you go, the warmer it becomes, the cool or uh, the cooler stratum of four C degrees C at the center and the warmer stratum on top, forming a kind of pressure gradient because then the anom anomaly at four degrees C is well known which means then you have a squirting water channel sweating out of the top of a mountain, wherever it finds a valve that the spring can escape into the open. A similar approach has been devised by, 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 for plants. I mean, here we have to discuss that Schauberger did not know about Pollux EC or um, exclusion zone property, but anyway, we can discuss it in the, in the Q and A section. However, what he did, perceive is there must be a charge separation between the various strata, between the exulium and the phloem in the plant in order to allow and enable the plant to become a kind of uh, an, an, a water, uh, water suction device. Because he says that when the plant starts to blossom in spring, it starts to blossom always on the top and not at the bottom, which means the suction comes from the top and not from the bottom. There's no pressure, osmotic or turgo pressure from below. This was his postulate. And to one way we can agree with that because the proponents of the widely accepted cohesion tension theory that drive the ascent of sap in trees encounter the problem that the cohesive strength of water must routinely resist forces equivalent to those produced by superheating to 100 degrees C. In other words, water breaks, it starts to cavitate. I mean, we have an audio file that, that shows you cavitation trees, but I should not spend too much on, on multimedia now because it's already almost an hour that we talk. And we still want to cover the QD section in, let's say, very, uh, uh, not to rush away. And that's, and so I skip this video and in every case we have time for the Q&A, we can always replay it. So I go back to a much more dramatic effect. Let's go to helium two. Helium-2 is a superfluid system. It's a very extreme case, I know, but helium-1 and helium-2 is a kind of exemplary test case where you can see what happens when we use these principles that Schaumburg had seen. Helium-2, when you go beyond uh, 4 Kelvin, uh, below 4 Kelvin and approach the lambda point to, at about 2.15 Kelvin, it suddenly stops behaving like a normal fluid but becomes a superfluid. It's a super coherent state. And what happens here is, and I need to show you this on the video, is peculiar because the light and superfluidity interact quite nicely. So let me show if I can open up Professor Light's lecture. So, we now go on. so let me see. You should see Mr. Leitner speaking. To another phenomenon. First of all, he explains the principle, what, what it is when he uses with, uh, down and then opens into a bulb. helium tube. A small piece of cotton is stuffed into the constriction between the tube and the bulb. 
and the bulb has been I hope you can hear the audio. One of the finest powders available. Jewelers rule. A second wad of cotton keeps the powder in the bulb. This powder presents extremely fine capillary channels. Their average diameter is a small fraction of one micron. This device has been placed in the doer. The liquid helium is below the lambda point. We submerge the bulb, and then we'll send a beam of light from this lamp to a point near the top. You will see the light beam when the lamp is turned on. It focuses some heat in the form of infrared radiation on the point in question. The temperature will rise above the temperature of the rest of the apparatus. Let us turn it on. <coughs> Liquid helium flows through the hole in the bottom of the uh, look at this. through the fine powder and rises above the level of liquid helium outside. The height to which it will go depends on the temperature increase produced by the lamp focused on the bulb. So it's defying gravity and moves higher than the surrounding liquid helium in the, in the, in the helium two stage. So let me go a little bit further on to the, the very end. Over here, it's three minutes. Okay, there is speaks about a practical demonstration of the fountain. An amusing demonstration of the same phenomenon again uses a bulb packed with rouge, but this one opens into a capillary. Light is beamed on a spot just below the capillary, and it produces a helium fountain. The phenomenon in this and the previous experiment has become known as the thermomechanical or the fountain effect. You can see the helium two jerks out at the top of the capillary. So let's go back to the presentation. So this sheds completely new insight into that what Schauberger conceived. Oh, the mouse is missing here. Okay. So you should see the presentation again. Another aspect before we come to the QD section is regarding a very interesting approach that he witnessed in the mountains, the Alpine mountains. And I only should read you a transcript that he recorded when he was actually attending one of the ceremonies. It wasn't the song that the old farmer bent over the water filled barrel, sang remarkably loudly into it, but a scale rich in vowels, which he ascended to the falsetto, uh, falsetto voice only to let it subside again to a glowing bass. As he sang the scale upward, he stirred with a spoon to the anticlockwise. Once he changed the voice pitch downwards, then he also changed the direction of the stirring clockwise. From time to time, the farmer threw a lump of clay, ground as small as possible with, the, with his hands into the barrel and continued singing, stirring soon right, soon left, and so forth. So you can imagine his singing and stirring this bell and the kind of start to to sing so he uses this particular water in order to fertilize the fields back then the farmers didn't have artificial fertilizers fertilizers and interestingly there was an in observable increase in yield by 30 percent so it contradicts completely that what agro-industrial practices are currently taking or the same you can use also vortex water and to obtain the same results. Over here, you have untreated water just put over the plant. This is treated water. This is experiments done by Hotberg with a, a vortexer, not a mechanical stirring by hands, but a vortexer. So, furthermore, then he came up with the idea okay, what does it mean if you want to have? Good water to drink. What does what, what makes a good drinking water? What characterizes it? So Schauberger formulated that under the exclusion of light and the precipitation of salts and minerals during cooling, you can obtain a water quality that should be suitable for mass consumption. And he received a prototype with ingredients and built it, and this was patented. So you can actually have a recipe which is accessible and do this one yourself. However, it's not as easy to reproduce. 
because one thing is how do you deceive this egg-shaped container? So it was not very clear, even though the patents describe it, but it's not very uh, precisely elaborated how it needs to be done. So there still needs to be experimental work before we can actually prove this. Another thing is characterizing water. We have already seen when we use centrifugation versus centripetation, we obtain different dark field images. When we use, for example, bottled spring water, everyone thinks a bottled spring water must be kind of clean and pure. That's not the case. We have a huge amount of biota inside. It means it's not um, bacteriologically contaminated, but there are good bacteria in it. So what you have up here is your quantity. For example, this is three different brands, avian, waters, and alcohol waters that have been analyzed. And you can all see over here, these are the kind of readouts that uh, the through flow cytometry provides. And you can see, well, with all these peaks and, and um, signals that it produces, which means there's a huge amount of biota inside these waters. If you look at the quality, you can even see how the properties differ from one water to the other. So spring water is not at all sterile and it's not at all without bacteria, which means we need to know that there are good bacteria and bad bacteria. And this is obviously something that Schauberger already envisioned back then. Now, um, I'm gonna skip this particular slide because we are running a little bit behind schedule. So this is yeah, all this. Stop. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. Uh, don't worry about time. <laughs> okay. No, not worry about time. Okay. Yes. Then we can, can lose a couple of seconds to this. So Schauberger came up with a kind of selective over the thumb qualification. What's the best water? What's the poorest water in order to have for human consumption? Of course, we know distilled water is unsuitable. According to him, it's unsuitable as well. However, he said that spring water is the best water, especially those one who will be jerked out due to suction and not to by pressure. And suction again, as we have seen by the, by the jerking helium fountain, as so a helium tool below the lambda point. This is the kind of approach that he wants to see in his interpretation is the best water. And I remember George in doing in one of his mountain excursions showed that there are certain alpine wells that not only have water at four degrees exit temperatures, but they have two degrees exit temperatures. And, and this is only one that we so far identified. And we are not quite sure why is this one having two degrees exit temperature while the others, most of the others are four. So there must be something peculiar happening inside the lit light lithosphere where the whole dynamics that Schauberger described so far about Artesian wells is taking place. So another aspect that Schauberger mentioned is you can influence this with electromagnetic energy. So you can influence with a dis uh, dissolved uh, mineral counters in water by exposing them to magnetic fields. And this is something that has been quite recently repeated by Corey and Cass. That showed if you expose water, mineral water, to very, let's say, relatively weak magnetic fields, in this case, you have a static magnetic field gradient of about 100 millimeters, which is quite huge. However, you have a flow gradient through it. So the flow gradient in this case depends how fast it is, but it's really huge that the, the gradient is enormous. Yet it works also with very, very low, sorry, with very, very low field synthesis as well, talking about 20 to 50 microteslas. And in this case, you can see that the precipitation pattern of the minerals dissolved, in this case, calcium, calcium carbonate, forms from calcite to aragonite. And this is something peculiar, because if you look at the organismic world, especially tropical coral reef in Japan has, in south, the southern tips of Japan has a huge area full of coral reefs, which is a characteristic feature of these organisms. They build up their massive skeletons with aragonite. So somehow they're capable of changing the crystallization patterns in order to make aragonite and not calcite. Yeah. So now we're coming to the theoretical interpretation because why? 
We have spoken about the wide spectrum of Schauberger's approach, especially his bionic achievement. So now we need to connect, uh, connect this with some theoretical aspects in order to put them in place. Where do we stand right now with modern physics? So it's going to be a little bit complex, but uh, give me a couple of minutes in order to guide you through this section. First of all, it's one thing that we need to know is life. Just, just look at this Gaussian-like graph over here highlighted very faintly, forms around this temperature. So this is the ideal set point, 300 Kelvin, where we can say water is suitable for living biota. We're not talking about extreme things like archaea, but let's say just, just us. And then we found out that both Preparata and Darbelli, so he was a student of Preparata, from the Instituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, so a nuclear physics institute in Milan, elaborated a theory based on quantum field theory that showed that water is, co is, is coherent or let's say ice-like also at room temperature at least the fraction rate is ice-like at room temperature and when, when Garbelli redid the calculations he found out that there's a better fit if we do the, the new knowledge the new findings incorporate them that you can actually see Preparata was about 45% at 300 Kelvin. Carbelli allocated that to almost 40% coherent fraction. So you have a coherent fraction plus a non-coherent fraction, which makes 100%. Yeah. So this means water can, be a, can have a coherent fraction well beyond the boiling point. So we are looking at the gaseous state and it goes all the way up to 700 degrees C. 700 degrees C in gaseous phase and you still have coherent fraction an ice-like fraction, so to speak, at, at, and at, at boiling point. In, in order to, to see what this means from the classical quantum mechanics transition, then you can actually look at this. When you have a coherent fraction with, let's say, a couple of particles oscillating with many degrees of freedoms, highly entropic, then it looks like this. If you correlate that and allocate them kind of a resonating principle, and couple them to each other in order that they can tune and they feel each other, then it becomes a coherently oscillating system with a single degree of freedom and quite negentropic. In order to envision that, I have found this nice animation that I don't want to uh, skip because this is quite funny. Okay. Let me go to I given, where is it, where is it? I given, so I hope you see it. So it is a, a Japanese video. And you can actually see, they start to, to tune these metronomes. They're all tuned to the same oscillation frequency, however, not coupled in phase. Which means you start them off in, in a very random way. However, these structures sooner or later start to organize in such a way as they feel the neighboring elements and they start to align each other to form a coherently oscillating ensemble acting as a whole group, a single identity acting as a whole group. So you don't have any more 32 individual entities, but one macroscopic entity. So I've accelerated that a bit. Now you can see it's almost coherent. There's one outlier over there, but even this one over here will soon align with the rest of the oscillators. So you, now you can see that using this analogy and every one of these 32 metronomes is a water molecule with a dipole moment. You can actually see that the dipole moments in the water molecule behave in a similar way. The oscillating coupling mechanism where is my mouse? So here is this plate. You can see the plate is swinging back and forth. And the swinging back and forth, this coupling, in this case mechanically, is done with the water molecules electrodynamic. So our little, oh no, he's, he's tuning in, he's tuning in, and, and yeah, almost there, almost there. And now he's aligning, so the phase difference becomes almost zero. And there we go. Now they are lined up. So.
Now, if you remove the bottom plate, however, it doesn't work anymore. So, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Yep. Good, so we talked about this. So it is a scale-free property in this case, because it doesn't have, the, okay, I should maybe briefly talk about this equation because you have the number of entities, in this case, the molecules, the, the, in this case, water molecules or the metronomes, and this is the phase angle. So the phase difference between them. So if we have approaching the phases towards zero, there's no difference between the oscillating patterns of these metronomes, they become zero, then this one turns maximum. You can actually see, you can upscale it from one entity from macroscopic level, you have um, next stage is the super coherent stage where you have the next oscillating property of a macromolecular cluster that acts as a coherent domain and so forth, super coherence. And we will elaborate it in the subsequent slides. So now I have to thank to Paolo Renati who helped me out with some of his uh, nice uh, interpretations because this was one of his uh, work during his PhD thesis. And it helped me a lot to, to visualize that what he has achieved in his thesis. So you have here two things. One is the ground state and excited state. So you have the hybridization state of oxygen and here the tetrahedral structure of the ice-like structures. And you can actually see it's a geometry, it's completely different. And it has been elaborated during the theoretical framework that it is the 5D orbital of the oxygen, which is relevant. Of course, there are others. But in this case, we, we say the best fit has been obtained with this one. It's the mathematical approach and allows us to understand. So what do we see in this particular graph? We see the photon energy and the oscillator strength. So the water vapor over here is exposed to photon energy and we can induce this spectra such all the way up to the first ionization threshold, which is 12.6 electron volts. We can induce proton separation by around 15 electron volts, and we can induce water splitting by using or applying 18, almost 19 electron volts. So water splitting, not with electrolysis, but used only with photonic energy. So when we have an incoming energy like this one, it elevates the water molecular structures to an excited state, relaxes it again. So it's a kind of an oscillation process where you no energy is lost, because you absorb it, and then get off at the later stage. When we consider, however, that there is much more happening in this particular case, because this is, if you look at this, 12.7 electron volts is this particular energy spectrum, which falls just half, or short, half an electron volt, which 12.6, which is over here, when the water molecule is ionized. So you end up with a charge of negatively or quasi-free elect uh, electrons in each coherence domain. And since there are millions of it, so it's a huge amount of electrical charge that's available of quasi-free electrons. And if you look at this from an absorption spectrum perspective, for example, in, in the permittivity of pure water, and you go all the way up to gigahertz and terahertz as per wavelengths, you literally see that the current theory doesn't fit for example, this is this gray curve over here. So this is the frequency, this is the ratio between the real and the imaginary part of the permeability of water. And you can actually see that there's a dashed line, which is somewhat odd. This is the theory that, that is, however, it should be that one, the black line. This is the data set that real measurements provide. So there is a mismatch, starting already off in the, 100, in the gigahertz range and then in the Harris range. But it was only recently that a colleague in Italy found out, at the near, found out that this is, if you use a single debug function with an attachment that takes into consideration the coherent fraction, that this vanishes. Which means an indirect proof that we have coherent fraction in water. That's the first time ever that this has been possible. And they look at the infrared spectra in general of water then you find it's quite interesting that you find all three phases in the spectrum. You find the water phase, uh, the vapor phase, the liquid phase, and the ice phase. So all of these three phases are embedded in one, let's say, envelope curve of the far infrared spectrum. 
And you can actually allocate that with vapor, which is that one over here, 25, 25 degrees, with the liquid phase, with that one, and the, ah, sorry, it's that one, and the ice phase, which should be, there's a color mismatch, it should be green. Anyway, yeah. However, you can deconvolize all these particular Gaussian subpeaks, and then you obtain, if you put them all together, the envelope curve, which is that one. So in infrared spectroscopy, you have now two evidences. As a general, in spectroscopy, you have two evidence. One is you have terahertz properties with an upgrade of the Debye function, and you have, in this case, the, the infrared spectroscopic data interpretation, which also ends up with a coherent identification. I'll skip this here because it's getting quite late. So um, now, when we have a single coherence domain, the cluster of water molecules that forms, the, like the metrons, as we've seen in the video, a cluster of coherent, a coherent structure and oscillating patterns, then you can actually see that this particular behavior of one coherence domain can interact with neighboring coherence domains and start to inter interact reciprocally. And this is particularly interesting, first of all, because the coherence domain doesn't or is not subject to thermal assault. What does it mean, thermal assault? If you look at the energy equations, the coherence domain, because of the perturbative ground state, let me go back to this particular graph that we have over here. Um, no, where is my little I thought I have, okay, then it's probably the next slide. Yeah, there it is, sorry. It is there. So we have the coherent ground state and the perturbative ground state. This is normal water when it starts to have multitudes of degrees of freedom and not any phase coupling. Then you have the coherent ground state, which is this one, which is energetically more favorable. It's like the spontaneous breakage of symmetry, but suddenly this one is low in energy, thus more stable and cannot be disturbed by thermal assaults. If you look at this particular relevant results, so KT by 298 degrees Kelvin as a Kelvin, which is corresponds to about 12 point, as a 25 milli electron, 26 milli electron volts. However, the energy gap between the PGS and the CGS ground state is 260 milli electron volts. So it's almost 10 times as much. So there's no way that a thermal disturbance, a thermal fluctuation can ruin the, co the coherent ground state. And this would explain why there is such thing as, for example, coherent phase at 700 degrees C. It's almost impossible. I mean, it's not, let's say, dominant, but it's still present. Yeah. Go back again. To the front of here. So in this case, and Paolo Renati has done here a huge favor in terms that I can graphically visualize this in such a way as now to show you what does it mean if you look at the excited and the coherent ground state when the oscillation becomes stable and phase coupled, phase locked in this particular oscillating regime. Because there you have tiny little energy gaps between the close, close to the ionization threshold, 12.7 as 12.6 electron volts. We are slightly below that. However, Depending on the quantitative quantization, you have now many, let's say, various modes of, of oscillation coupling mechanisms. On the macroscopic scale, microscopic scale, you have higher frequency. On the macroscopic scale, you have lower frequency, which means the microscopic scale, it's in the mega gigahertz range. On the macroscopic scale, you can all the way down to kilohertz range. And I have not shown you yet that the results from Wilhelm Reich when he uses the cloud buster or Pierluigi Igina when he comes up with his cloud busting device that he uses frequency in the one hertz range which means he's using and working with clouds in the super coherent domains in the hertz range macroscopic domains yeah. but this will be something that we can talk about next time anyway so this this is um, a way of in interaction where biomolecules can now interact with the water directly in order that the coherent fraction stimulates the biochemical pathway. In this case, you reverse the entire biodynamics 
which means the biophysical, in this case, quantum electrodynamic principle to govern the biochemistry that is secondary comes up as a result of the coherent coupling between the water and the biomolecules present in the particular neighborhood. In order to make this more comprehensive, I'll show you briefly in a couple of seconds, a demonstration. So what we end up here is a laser-like behavior. We have a coherent decoupling among water molecules that seem to have laser-like properties. This requires though that we are below a critical density. And this critical density, because this is a water aerosol, which is water vapor and gaseous systems, need to have a critical density in order that they perceive each other. Once this is fulfilled and once this is given, a coherence domain can be established and the oscillation, as we have seen in the metronomic demonstration, starts to take off and is a self-stabilizing system. So how does this relate to health? Now the crucial point is, how can we study this? How can we do this in, in the biochemical field? There is one approach, for example, in this particular case, they use X-ray absorption spectroscopy with kinetic absorption spectroscopy and try to see how much water is necessary in order to set off a particular biochemical pathway. What they didn't, however, consider is Gilbert Link's association induction hypothesis. In Gilbert Link's association induction hypothesis, he states that most proteins in a cell at rest are fully extended instead of being in the conformative secondary structure. For example, alpha helical or beta helical beta, uh, beta sheets, huh? so that the bonds along the polypeptide backbones are freely to interact with the surrounding water molecules. Doing so, the water peptide structure from polarized multilayers of aligned water molecules with ATP and ions stabilize it. In the absence of ATP, however, proteins tend to adopt the secondary structure. Now we have the clue. So if we have a functional protein, the water must enter in decoherent state. Once the water enters in the coherent state, because it picks up again the energy from the quantum, back, uh, quantum vacuum fluctuations or any other secondary uh, energetic process that feeds in a stable, let's say resonant pattern that pops up again, then you have a deactivated protein. Suddenly you have not a biochemical switching on and off of proteins, but the biophysical mode where you can switch on and off of proteins. So in order to come now from the nanoscale to the microscale, let's look at the coherence domain as a single entity. So we have the fractal property, the self the scale free property. So these are the coherence, the water molecules forming one coherence domain. This is now the water molecules as a new entity, however, constituted, constituted of millions of molecules. Then super coherence with many of these coherences, coherence domains clustering together with molecular so this contaminants, let's call it ions that are that traced in between, that form this mesoscale property. And this goes all the way up to macroscopic domains. And I would like to show you how these implications can be seen in, in a wider range. And I do this first with this particular sketch. We look at this coherence domain and how the coherence domain changes the frequency during the top moments. So we have the coherence domains engaged in an oscillation, attracts because of the excess energy, because it oscillates back and forth between the ground and the excited state with the quasi free electrons on the surface of the coherence domain, which is this particular azzurro like halo attracts or let's involve certain ions that correspond to this particular resonance frequency and changes the product. So these ions react and do something. In turn, however, the coherence domain changes the resonance frequency. And once the resonance frequency is changed, it turns out that now other biomolecules can be tuned and forced to a reaction. And in a third step, the same procedure repeats again with the same coherence domain, yet again with a different resonance frequency. And again, so forth. So now you can envision, for example, that a Krebs cycle or a CAC cycle can be interpreted completely with a quantum electrodynamic approach. Now, given the time that we are, it's, it's already 
until 30 minutes over, I'm not going to talk about the field. Maybe we, during the discussion, talk about the field properties and field patterns that prevail in the coherence domain and how it can act as a, because it's a shielding more or less, and what the vector potential is all about. I'll skip that maybe for the Q&A section, because this is already almost the last slide, and then I will leave the space for Q&As. So what does it mean in terms of the living structure? It means for the terms of this structure, we all compose the water. Not in terms of mass, it's not so much the mass that's interesting, it's the number of, of, of water molecules in the body. And if you count the numbers in, of water molecules in the body, then it's topping everywhere almost 100%, almost. And this fits nicely to this equation, where you have the population, the number of molecules, if water, and the phase coupling, which tends to zero. So you can have this at the biomolecular level, Oh, sorry, at the molecular level, then again, super coherence at the organelle level, at the cellular level, and the next level of super coherence at the organismal level, and the next level of coherence at the social level, and so forth. What this means is, if we consider this as the homeostatic set point, where life can unfold, everything that deviates from there, for example, a de-stressing event goes down, induces a pathology. Everything goes up again, like an oyster event, maybe over, coherently stimulates the system, but it needs to go come back to this particular set point because if you have so much or too much coherent structures in there, then nothing happens anymore. We need this imbalance between non-coherent and coherent fraction. So, and this fits nicely into that what back then Romiana said in, in March of this year, that we have a kind of analogy between the musical tones and the harmonical structures, and that what we see in the vanic structures in aquaphotomics. So we see that what's happening in more or less the same way from the measurement data that can be obtained in aquaphotomics. And this is the way where we should start off our investigation, experimental investigation, in order to understand what can be extracted with this kind of new physical vision that we have available in order to interpret aquaphotomic spectra in such a way as to see a directly document and provide the evidence that coherence is the denominator, the common denominator of all the Earth and all living processes. So with that, I come to the end. So we talked a lot about Schauberger. We talked a lot about his interpretation, the theoretical model. So there's no space for Reich, but this one, I promise you, will be the subject of the next talk sometime in, in the future. And for the moment, I just stop it here. And I said, well, Romiano may have retired, but this, as, as I know her, mm. this is a huge incentive for her to start now doing the stuff that maybe too much time has passed and she hasn't had the chance to do it so. So thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions. Thank, thank you, you, Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. This was a really fantastic. Uh, so from my point of view, I just want to say, uh, I'm very, very grateful that you finally uh, put it in, let's say normal words, what coherence is, what soliton is, because uh, prior to this lecture, I was always, I always had very vague concepts. It didn't sound very um, clear to me what is what. So, um, yeah. We can start with the question. I don't want to talk uh, too much. We have uh, like a half an hour. So yeah. um, who, who has a question? Uh, can we give him Ooh. a word, Florence? Please raise hands. Well, uh, okay, Paul. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, just a quick, a quick comment. Uh, thank you, Pierre, very much for your amazing work uh, in connection to all the topics. Um, I was I was thinking that uh, the dynamics uh, that you showed in the, the vortex uh, that uh, uh, concentrates in the center, the let's say the the spurious part, the the, the impurities. No, yeah. maybe it could be that. Uh, it's something that could be interesting for um, decodify to decodify better the the still uh, uh, unexamined in depth uh, phenomenon of the self fluxing tube uh, by Jerry Pollack. No, you know the the, the, the 
the the tube that is able uh, being of uh, being made of uh, hydrophilic uh, material mm -hmm. at external you have not the, the device that can purify water you know yeah, yeah. and uh, the the classical explanation of this is that you can create easy water at the periphery you know adhered to the surface and in the center you of course accumulate the solutes mm -hmm. but maybe as you shown that in this uh, dynamics there is something let sorry for this but more dynamical in the sense that maybe is nothing is not all, something that is only a static process in the sense that here no, it's there is the EZ and here there exactly. is the uh, but maybe also a vortex uh, dynamics is involved just uh, uh, an hypothesis that I wanted to share with you hmm. I completely agree with that what you said because that one but I mean in order that the others understand what's happening I should maybe put a brief uh, uh, image to that I obtained from Jerry's lab. Okay, let me so I can open that. So the others know what we are talking about. So let me share this. Yes, yes, uh, uh, show it. So it is useful. So can you see the video? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, uh, so this Mina is working with a uh, Nafion tube. And it looks like this is something very static. And I'm not agreeing at all that, with the interpretation from, from Jerry Pollux. I completely agree with that, what Paolo just said. It's a highly electrodynamic oscillating system. So, and look at this. I mean, it's not a gravitational gradient that you see here. I need to show you now the other video. Um, this is this here, because this is the same stuff, only with a difference that, oops. Oops, where is it? Sorry. Oh, okay. I completely knocked it off. Let me open it again. With a uh, gel. So there it is. Okay, I'll give you the video. Now you should see the video. So it's not a gravitational gradient because the microscope's object slide or something is tilted. That's what Paul is mentioning is exactly that. You have now the accumulation of debris in the center. So what you see over here is the gel, the hydrogel. And this is a pore, it's a kind of a channel. The channel where there's a per, uh, kind of the water can flow. And you see that this hydrogel acts like a, a nafia membrane, accumulating all the debris, this is polystyrene latex spheres, in the center of the tube. And if we allow this video to go, the light, the infrared light pumps the system through. And it's not at all a static phenomena, it's a highly dynamic, dynamic phenomena, which means electromagnetic radiation is an oscillation. Element. I'm so now inspired to say something. <laughs> I hope uh, Takeuchi Sensei is here, because uh, only now I uh, realized uh, you're talking about light, and he worked with um, uh, vitability of surfaces and uh, there is uh, he worked with titanium oxide and uh, which is super uh, hydrophilic if i remember and uh, actually this property was induced by light because light changed the surface of material and what all i see here all i saw in whatever you showed vortex uh, there is no vortex there is no uh, this uh, dynamic flow turbulent flow if you don't have interface or surface, water exactly. has to be on yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. When the vortex is the vortex formation is maybe best visualized in the hyperbolic funnel. However, we only have we also have to speak, and that's what Paolo mentioned, that electrodynamic vortices. So vortices that are manifest or become manifest as an electromagnetic radiation within the system, and you only can measure them indirectly. So it's not that you 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 see them straight off. But what we probably need to show is how can we use or scan them like a spectrum analyzer approach in order to see how this fractal property of the vortex becomes manifest as harmonical fingerprint regions that we can measure in the electromagnetic field range, as in the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm. I'm not quite sure whether I answered your question properly, but that's what I would do. Okay, so I'll come in. Hi. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Ciao, Yeah, um, just clarification. Uh, we are talking about easy zone made by light. Okay. Yep. So you have, you have light induced. So light makes structures. Yep. And making structure means induced coherence. 
Mm, so, certainly agree. So, yeah. Yes. And once you make structure immediately, you have charge distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I agree with Paul and, and uh, of course, Yelena. So we have surface uh, um, formed by this structure, um, but we have a dynamic process that. Yep. Yep. Um, it's not a static, static at all, it, it could never be static. But uh, what you said and why we have this in the center is because we have the, the uh, organizing of the water inside the, the pipe. Yeah. yeah. So, and maybe the, what we have to prove is um, if, if we have in this pipe um, uh, the, 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 the flow, of Schaubanger. And we can, we can yeah, we can define this the, the, the flow by the spectrum of the flow. That that this is for sure. We can take the spectrum, mm -hmm. and even though it is a dynamic process, we, we will always have an average um, mm -hmm. of the spectrum, but what any any change over the time will influence the spectrum, the average spectrum over the time. So we can we can see this. With the spectrum. This is interesting that you mentioned it because this would actually take a lot of the controversy out that Jerry Pollack presented in his uh, interpretation. That when you use the nephew, look at the nephew membrane, then you have the Teflon backbone, so to speak, and the sulfonic side chains. But the sulfonic side chains are highly, let's say, charged. They have a pH of around one or two. So, which means they have a, a strong proton gradient. Yes. In that case, the charge electrodynamically oscillate with the medium, in this case, the water. So there must be something. And probably we, if, if we now take in Schauberger, we see this kind of ball bearing vortices around at the center, uh, at the periphery, and at the mm -hmm. center, you have this vortex. However, how do we make it visible? This is something that, that I need to ask you all in order to contribute yeah, to yeah, ideas, yeah. incentives. Yeah, well, in the lab, we have been always doing consecutive spectra. And consecutive spectra means light induced changes in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it very nicely. You can subtract and see what kind of structure we, we make with the light, but it's not only structure making. So it is a dynamic process of rearranging of yeah, the yeah, yeah, molecular, yeah. molecular structure. So we have, um, and what you said this time, and uh, I picked up and I, I really, uh, it was a, a yes, 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 kind of. <laughs> uh, we, need, <laughs> we, need a, we need a balance. Uh, we need a balance between coherent and non-coherent yeah. um, states uh, or, or phase or, or um, space of water molecule distribution. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and we can see this in, in different when we look at different types of water. Yeah. Uh, we could see highly um, coherent water. Yeah. With, yeah. with a very low um, a level of incoherent zone. So but that makes the face of the water. So we have waters that, that have a balance between coherence mm -hmm. and non-coherence at certain level, having yep. more coherent state and less incoherent and vice versa. So we have yep. waters that are highly incoherent and then less coherent in, on the other side. So, and that makes different waters with different functionalities. Yeah, but this brings me into mind that, that research uh, uh, project that you did with Habalea. Yeah, exactly. With, because that's, that's what you showed. So it, it's perfectly one fits of, into this context. Yeah. Yes, one of, one of the old, old examples. So, Sorry, just, sure. um, uh, we have one more uh, question from Mr. Lackinger. Can we... Uh, thank you, thank you, Ellen. A little thank bit you. of time, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, at first, I want to thank you that I am invited as a student for this uh, Christmas special. Um, my question is about the mechanical uh, influence on the current domains, because um, in, the, in the theoretical part, um, you talked about the uh, uh, influence of light to the current state. But as I understood, Schauberger worked um, with mechanical um, impact on on the water. So is there already a theory or some experiments which, um, which describe this, this mechanical impact on these current domains? Good question. Thank you. And I'm glad that you found time to, to join our meeting here. 
welcome. So, um, <laughs> yes, I think the problem though is Schaubrecke does not have or did not have the possibilities to study this kind in, the in, in theoretical domain because he doesn't have had access to physics, to highly sophisticated physics, especially modern physics, given that he was living 80, 70, 80 almost 100 years ago. So, however, what he did by using a vortex, he was structuring the water such a way that he induces charges and the mechanical perturbation induced charge into the water masses. And you probably remember the slide where he showed the one dips the finger, the cone, the exit cone of the hyperbolic funnel and the water jet that comes out suddenly expands. So this sudden expansion is kind of an electrostatic, uh, electrodynamic, sorry, not a static, electrodynamic effect, which means the water is energized to one way or the other, probably to such an extent as the dipole moments of the water become already oriented towards a more coherent like state. So he was using the coherent approach by inducing first mechanical perturb perturbation, and then out of the mechanical perturbation, he probably, we could actually now say that the electrodynamic consequences can be deduced because of the mechanical perturbation. Does this answer your question? Yeah, so, so yeah. it's um, when I understood could, it right, could so I help it's you? Uh, like a, um, this two, this two, um, uh, you want to unify together theory. Right? Yeah. If you if you want, I can add something to to help Pierre mm -hmm. to, go ahead, to go ahead, reply Paul. to to Mister Lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think that one of the first uh, of the first connection between the uh, spectroscopic and electrodynamic properties and the mechanical dynamic um, can be uh, find in the fact that uh, the coherent domains uh, are somehow devices where you have uh, quantized vortexes of uh, peripheral electrons. They are called mm -hmm. the cold vortexes. Cold vortexes, yeah, exactly. These electrons cannot dissipate energy uh, through thermalization because they are coherent, you know, and they are protected mm -hmm. by an energy gap. So what happens? What is happening is that when you perturbate, uh, you know, this charge that is vorticating around the coherence domain is uh, sometimes is somehow a, a mass that is flowing. So we have also acoustic and mechanical movement in the coherence domain. So what happens that you you can affect the vortication of these electrons also through macroscopical, you know, uh, mechanical treatments. And this is at the basis of the succussion in homeopathy and all those, all those mechanical treatments that influence also chemical, physical properties of water, spectroscopical mm -hmm. properties. So the connection is that the coherence domain are some somehow mesoscopic structures that uh, has also have also a mechanical constitution because you have that these electrons create flows and these flows in in turn are influenced and are and can influence the macroscopical at several at the successive level flows you know this is the point uh, by which we can connect the coherence status of water and for instance temperature or uh, uh, the mechanical treatment and the friction you know this is uh, uh, is something that has to be a lot a lot a lot deepened but you know at least qualitatively we have an idea yep 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 thank you thank you Paolo. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um paulo I'm, I'm so happy to hear what, what you said and um uh, talking about the sound now I'm in the lab, aquaphotomics lab of Yunusato, if you remember. I think many people remember. Um, so we're doing experiments with sound here, and we could see changes in the spectra. Um, mm -hmm. So v -lands. I think you are and Pierre are the ones that have to take these spectral tools yep. and, and prove all this Schauberger, so we can help, of course all this, this Schauberger uh, phenomena, because everything I heard tonight, um, and we have, we have been discussing this also uh, before, I think it, it, not that I think, it, it should be proven, it is possible to be proven by, by spectroscopy, yes. I think so too, I mean, th and there's more on that. 
Um, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can show you the, the slides that have been included in the extended version. There is um, um, an, a set of, of an audio experimental approach where you can actually see photonics emissions. So it's a phonon photon coupling mechanism that results in electrodynamic phenomena. So let me see if I find that. In the meantime, we can uh, ask someone or allow someone else to ask a question. Well, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, so I'm um, by the end of your presentation, I got a little bit, now let's say, confused. Uh, what you said about um, this resistance to uh, thermal disturbance. So, yep. coherence, coherent domain cannot be disturbed. So, for example. I would change the environmental temperature, but let's say um, water, which uh, is uh, coherent, will not change the temperature. Is that the case? Did okay, I understand? I, I, I open up the, let me see where's my screen here. So you should see now this particular slide. Do you see it? Yes? Yep. So, okay. I mean, it's not in full view. No, it's not in full view. It's uh -huh. probably just, it's just sufficient to see what is all about here. So it's about the coherent and the perturbative ground state. The coherent ground state is that state that allows you to obtain an energy more energetically more favorable state, which means it's below the ground state, uh, the perturbative ground state. The PG PGS over here in red is because the, uh, the degrees of freedom, the water dipole or the water molecules with the dipole moments have are not allowed to enter a resonance phase, which means the resonance phase, once they get in resonance, is the energetic more stable approach. Once they're more stable, they're less subject to perturbances because they are now have one single resonance frequency, which means for them, it's like if you have a, a, a bunch of people walking over a bridge and this bridge starts to oscillate, try to walk asynchrony in asynchronicity with these other people. It's very difficult to walk in asynchronicity if the bottom, if the floor of the bridge starts to oscillate because this troop of, of soldiers or marching soldiers over the bridge starts to enter in resonance with the bridge. You automatically fall in tune with those people walking in this particular uh, pace. And, and this is one aspect. The second aspect is, is from, the, uh, from the equations from in the quantum field theory, we know that the en energy difference between the perturbative and the coherent ground state is about 260 electron volts, uh, 260 milli electron volts, and is according to the Boltzmann distribution, the KT product, is far more stable and it's already mathematically mathematically impossible to bring it out of tune. What you need to do is you have to at least warm it up to a thousand degrees approximately C in order to be induce the decoherence. So the KT, because it's a kind of a stochastic, uh, a chaotic stochastic process in that case, and not tuned to a resonance frequency does not allow you to to disturb the coherence. The coherence is as long or as prevalent as long as any phase coupling takes place. And the phase coupling between these water molecules takes place with, with um, the vector potential. But we haven't had yet time to lock, talk about the vector potential because otherwise uh, we talk, we'll talk. we talk about past noon to lunchtime or let's mm -hmm. say past six o'clock. But anyway, uh, allow me to say to, just to wrap up the question to, 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 the, to the very essence. It's, it's all about the energy difference between a coherent and oscillating state and a non-coherent phase. And it's far more energetically, energetically requiring to induce chaos because you have to mess up everything rather than to oscillate them as we have seen with the metronomes in a coherent fashion because they fall into this energetically more favorable state. Does this answer your question to a certain extent? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I have to think because, um, because uh, my experimental results, what I see uh, regarding the influence of light mm -hmm. and um, temperature, and I'm trying to connect that with the certain, uh, let's say, samples, which I think are having lots of coherent domains. So yeah. 
according to my results, currently uh, they're in opposition to what you were saying. But I'm not. I'm really not sure. I'm not sure well, if I get if I get it uh, correctly. What um, what you it would, just it would be interesting to see one of your results in order to see what kind of interpretation you mm -hmm. popped over it, mm -hmm. and how can we see it from a different angle? I don't have it yet interpretation. I have to study more coherence domains and just what you are talking uh -huh. about energy. Uh -huh. So, uh, but yeah. I hope to share when I uh, as soon as I understand. Trust me, I would share it with everyone. <laughs> Not just. I mean, this can be done in any any time. It's just uh, an informal meeting over the net, and and <laughs> and you see how we can interpret this data that you have mm. obtained in such oh. a way as to see a common denominator. You can well, you can see if you take the spectra. There is one part of the spectra which is very very interesting, and um, so far we think it is the uh, only part of the spectra which is not not coherent, corresponding to non coherent. Uh -huh. However. So it is around uh, from 1430 to uh, 1450 nanometers uh -huh. around. I think Paolo remembers uh, uh, from the temperature experiment, you had the same like 10, 10 nanometer size. So I now see that in some kind of samples, for example, that do not change the temperature, even though they should change the temperature, but they don't. However, uh -huh. they show strong absorbance exactly in this region. So they're characterized, you know, if you want, I could add a little hint about the relationship between the energy gap uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the temperature. temperature. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if I can share just one slide. I don't know if it's possible. Maybe oh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, just uh, showing this. Uh, this uh, can you see my, my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, look just at this uh, for a second. You know, uh, the, the, the energy gap actually is something that is not homogeneous uh, in, in the whole coherence domain. Why? Because the energy gap uh, follows the profile of the field, and the profile of the field inside the domain is, uh, is something that has this shape uh, in the, with the uh, once alone domain. And, uh, you know, you can have an overlap when you have two domains next to each other. So what does it mean? It means that the molecules that are on the periphery has a less protection, of course, from the thermodynamic, from the thermal agitation with respect to those ones that are in the center. Mm -hmm. This explains why, uh, you know, you, you have a sort of, of uh, different situation that uh, the molecules can experience in a lot of, let's say, shades states, no? That pass from the fully incoherent stuff uh, outside to the fully coherent stuff inside. So what does it mean? mean that uh, It means that we have uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the coherent state has a density, for instance, that does not depend on temperature. Uh, in its in not, namely, but uh, you know, no, you, you have this this uh, expression of density. You have that the coherent fraction has a constant density that it does, doesn't depend on temperature, while the incoherent fraction has a density that depends on temperature. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the volume of the coherent fraction is decreasing with uh, the rising temperature. So going back, uh, the fact is that uh, until you have a core, of course, uh, uh, inside the domain, you have uh, molecules that um, can maintain a sort of minimal entropy, almost zero. But uh, the, the more the temperature is rising, rising and the more the periphery is, uh, let's say, biting and <laughs> erasing the coherent volume. So, uh, just to tell you, some in some cases you don't see. If I understood well, uh, Yelena, what you tell, you don't see a certain dependence on temperature is yep. correct, or in other you see that maybe you have to consider Change. also it doesn't which change the temperature. Okay, okay. Yep. Maybe you have also to consider what can stabil stabilizes uh, certain phases in the system. For instance, like Antonella showed uh, a lot, lot of times, when you have nafion, for instance, you have that uh, 
at the interface with Nafion, you have an accumulation, a stabilization of the coherent fraction, and a sort of a repulsion of all stochastic part of stochastic molecules outside. It doesn't mean that you have a new phase in a thermodynamical sense, but in a dynamical sense, there you have a sort of implementation. What does it mean? It means that maybe if you change temperature, you cannot see the same variation, the same dependence of uh, coherent fraction with respect to temperature as in the bark, because you have a certain stabilization. So the same, if you have certain ions, certain molecular species that stabilizes one of the two phases, or implements you know, the one of the two phases, uh, augmenting or depleting the energy gap, you see alterated temperature dependencies, okay? in the system. Mm -hmm. So you maybe you don't see the same, no, the same variation when you change temperature or you see another kind. I don't know if I managed to, to explain you something better. Mm. Maybe I confounded you more. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Helena, Helena, just, mm. just think about... Let me see if I find this proper... No, graph. just think about the, the waters that have different structure, they mm -hmm. have different temperature. Mm -hmm. This is the point. To, to start uh, yes, okay, okay. collaborating what Paul just said. Mm -hmm. It's very nice what he, he said that in the coherent domain, okay, it is a coherent domain that all the molecules are um, vibrating with a certain frequency, but on, on the, the edge of the domain, you have already, uh, temperature is eating some of those members of the, the coherent mm -hmm. domain, so, but you still preserve the structure. Mm -hmm but then you have a different dynamics of the temperature change, changes, depending on the perturbation that's coming outside. Well, you need some time, everybody does. I mean- Yes, I think uh, when Paolo was talking, I was thinking, uh, I think I need everyone to talk slower. <laughs> Other, um, my brain is- Well, <laughs> the, the problem that we all face here is that in universities, you hardly hear anything about this stuff. That's true, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it makes it so difficult to, to pack everything that has happened over the last 80 years in, in, in modern physics into, let's say, a session that only lasts for one or two hours. <laughs> yes. you're, you're facing all the same problem. And, uh, yeah, and, well, and that's be positive and, and think that it is a good thing which we have started um, so we can continue. Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry. Elena, the difficulty mm -hmm. is that we are uh, habited to reason in terms of molecules, no? But yeah. uh, ah, you, imagine, you have to imagine that we are shifting completely the, the, the approach because we are speaking of fields. But uh, for one main reason, the photons that you use in spectroscopy, that are infrared photons, for instance, are huge respe with respect to molecules. So each time that you make a measurement, you are involving uh, an amount of molecule that it's uh, you can only see the average between what is in the core of the domain, what is in the, in the <laughs> interface, what is there is in the in the interstitial non coherent fraction. Yeah, yeah. So, in dependence of how the weight <laughs> of this stuff is, you can see an average measure of that. So, uh, reasoning, of course, of local situation when you are making infrared spectroscopy is nonsensical because uh, you should have photons that has the size of molecules, but uh, you should go to X-rays or, or or even smaller. Or, and uh, what happens that uh, in that in that kind of measurement you would destroy all mm -hmm. the, the situation yes, yes. because you put out of coherence the, the molecule mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. So you know. It's a sort of, of loop that <laughs> you have to switch to the, to, from the, the corpuscular vision to the field vision, otherwise... <laughs> Don't worry, I, I, so I'm not a chemist, so I never even had a molecular vision of, at all, but I could not, you know, uh, it is very nice what you said about the size of the photon, now it's yeah, yeah. Uh, a better thing that I understand. Uh, we need, so we are a bit behind time, so I just want to say maybe someone else has uh, a some kind of question. Uh, Lawrence, in the meantime, please put the poll on. So please, uh, uh, we will now be giving you a short questionnaire for all the participants. To just please uh, fill in uh, with your answers because we would like to know what you thought about the seminar, about this webinar. And um, 
if we can have some improvements. So while we're doing, while we're all doing that, uh, I'm going to scan audience to ask if there are any more questions for Pierre Madel. This was fantastic lecture. Uh, I'm really glad I, I uh, thought when I heard you at the conference that this was the first time that I actually came to grasp what coherent domain is. Everybody is speaking in a very, very difficult terms. This was very, very nice that I could see what you what you really, and you were explaining very, in a very plastic way, easy, easy to pass. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad that now we are in the format of, of incorporating these new aspects in such a way as to present it to the scientific community, mm -hmm. because for a long time, hardly anyone wanted to know about this. I'm dying to know all of this. I yeah. really know about these other people. But uh, again, we didn't, um, so maybe we could also plan again one webinar in future with you To It would be nice to see uh, also the second part of your talk. Yep. About, I'm, I'm, uh, I already have enough material, but it only needs to be restructured. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, so all Pierre, right. Just, just one word for, for Pierre. Pierre, I yep. really hope that all your knowledge that you have uh, acquired, um, if you join aquaphotomics measurements, um, you will really, really help the whole uh, community. So well, we'll be very, very happy to, uh, because I'm, I know that we can prove coherence in a living system and with spectroscopy. And we can prove that um, the interaction between the, the water coherence is the one that brings the interaction in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That could be proven. Mm -hmm. So experimentally, um, Paolo is right telling that uh, we have destructive, that light is destructive. Well, X-ray, yes, uh, UV, yes, but we have this new infrared light, which is, mm -hmm. well, it, it is changing the system, but it's not. Yeah. Active. So uh, by the changes that we cause to the system, we can learn about this, this system. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the way to go, I think. Thank you Perfect. very much. Yeah, really. I, 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 can, I can only accept your offer because now that we have the FOSS NER in our lab, and I'm only looking now for the extension model because it's a rapid content analyzer and we would like to extend it now with a rapid liquid analyzer. <laughs> and I found someone who is really having it. So we just negotiate how can we get the stuff over. And and Wieland is ready to get some measurements again. Or that we're going to do some measurements together again. So we gradually move forward to fully incorporate that into aquaphotomics. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I would like to thank really Elena for the idea of having this Christmas webinar. It has been a great idea. And yep. she I agree. Uh, and I think we, we, we don't need only Christmas to do webinars. We can continue. That was a very good start with very good presents on the top. Yeah. There are definitely the Japanese yeah. holidays. Let's take a Japanese holiday for, for yeah. incentive. <laughs> 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 Wonderful, yeah. Uh, then, um, so for the, for the end of the webinar, we will just, um, I just have to ask Lawrence, so uh, the number we chose, the number which was chosen by random number is which one? 20, 25. 25 is uh, on our list. So the winner of our book for this webinar is number 25 on our list. That's uh, Tomohiro Hayashi, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Hayashi Sensei are here. <laughs> I hope you're here. Well, uh, yes, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Hayashi Sensei. So, uh, I just have to ask you to please um, send us your um, address to which you would like to have the book, and this is our present for you. The, um, oh, it's for great! Christmas. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed. I I got really uh, many inspiration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Very Congratulations. Nice. Congratulations. So with this, uh, I think 
I can only say, really, Pierre, thank you uh, uh, for attending and for giving Welcome. this wonderful uh, Thank talk. you uh, for giving me this chance, no? for, for oh. al allowing us. I hope we will have a, a chance to continue. Uh, I would love oh, to no, hear no, the, the Don't worry, side. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and Great. we will keep in touch. Yeah. Thank you everyone for attending. It's, it has been a really, really um, pleasure for me to host the webinar, to hear all your questions and discussions and to see so many people interested in antiphotomics. I'm also grateful to audience for giving us uh, suggestions for improvements and for suggested topics. We had uh, already like two or three topics that we would really like to hear more. Something is about plant stress, something is about assignments in combination band and in short over term region. So stay with us, we will probably be back uh, next year. <laughs> well, uh, to once more thanks, um, thank you, uh, Pierre, thank you, Alex, who gave um, uh, last webinar and um, to all of you, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from Aphthomics <laughs> Society. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you for bye -bye. attending. Thanks for attending. Bye bye. Bye oh, bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Roberto. <laughs> nice to see you. Bye bye, Rumiana. Bye bye, Rumiana. Bye. Ciao Pier. Ciao Paolo. Bye bye Tomo Costanza. Ti chiamo troppo, ti chiamo tra poco. Ci sentiamo stasera, sì. <ride> Roberto, bye bye. Ciao Roberto. Ciao, ciao a tutti, ciao. Ciao. Ciao, ciao Roberto. Roberto, ci sentiamo dopo, eh? Sì, sì, a dopo, grazie. Ciao, ciao. 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 Well, next time we learn Italian. <ride> <ride> bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. 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 Step. Okay. Yeah, that was great. Really. Yeah, he doesn't hear. Okay. Anymore. He removed his headphones. Okay. Oh. Just take. No, because this one did not run out. Boof. Yeah, this was took two hours. Or over two hours. Ja, aber jetzt sind wir fertig. Jetzt ja. ist noch weiter, jetzt haben, ich bin so bin ich noch online. Die haben wir noch nicht ausgeschaltet. Okay, warte mal, ich stelle mir das aus.